may give you insights and understanding that he has not yet given unto me. I am told, though I have been unable to substantiate this, that the Hebrew people use the word meditate uh, in the same way that a cow is thought to chew the cud. That a cow goes out early in the morning, it takes into one of his three stomachs all sorts of nourishment it has not yet digested. Later in the cool of the day, it will lie down in the shade of a tree and chew the cud and extract all of the thoughts and nourishment, whatever, from that food that's there. I'm hoping that you'll be able to do this with scriptural thoughts and ideas that the Holy Spirit in the middle of the night or in the quiet of some moment today is going to enlighten and quicken your minds. Let's begin. Uh, I have found five men in the Bible named John in the New Testament scriptures. Who are they? Yeah. John the Apostle. John the Baptist, there's two. John Mark, there's three. These are a little harder, the next two. Beg pardon? Uh, Simon, son of John, there's, there's one. And then in Acts chapter 4 and verse 6, there was a f guy named John Alexander. He was a part of the high priest's family. Now we're going to be talking about John the apostle, his father was Zebedee. They had a fishing boat with hired servants in it. He was a cousin of Jesus, a cousin of John the Baptist. And one of the early disciples began following Jesus down at Bethany beyond the Jordan where Jesus obtained his first disciples. And uh, he had a problem with his temper as a young man. You remember that? Jesus called him, Mark chapter 3, verse 17. Boanerges. James and John, they're sons of thunder. Lord, call down fire on these people, like Elijah did. You know, we don't, they're not nice to us. We ain't going to be nice to them. Now, we're going to be talking about the love of God today. And this is kind of an interesting thing, that if you love them that love you, that's no big deal. I just read a book last week, Search for the Heart of God, and it just gave me, anyhow, it was 1979, a missionary goes to a big fashionable church on the East Coast, and uh, he's expecting to preach the morning message, but when he gets there, he's informed that he gets the missions minute. You know, you ain't going to speak the whole time, buddy. You got 60 seconds or whatever. So... Uh, it's 1979, Jimmy Carter's president, and we've got a whole bunch of American citizens held hostage by the Ayatollah Robala Khomeini. So he gets up there and says, how many of you are praying for the hostages every day? Boy, every hand goes up. How many of you are praying that the Iranians will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Just a few hands go up. He says, oh, I thought this was a Christian group and this was a Christian church. <laughs> Whoa. Is that right or wrong? Amen. Does God love the Iranians? Amen. Does God love the Iraqis? Yes. Well, uh, John, he came to the place where he understood this. He called himself the disciple that Jesus loved, and he writes the word uh, 46 references to love in 1 John. So he came around, and uh, he was, I don't know how old he was. This book is not, uh, it's hard to date. It, there's, there's, it's not signed, and we don't know who it was sent to. But oh, he wrote five, uh, John wrote five inspired books of scripture. What are they? Gospel of John? 1st, 2nd, 3rd John? Revelation. Very good. Now, uh, I've been going for years down into Old Mexico, a couple hundred miles south of the border, up there in the mountains, teaching a bunch of preachers. And uh, some of them cannot read or write. And it's, it's kind of nice uh, you know, the snow is beautiful on a mountain. It's beautiful under a microscope. Anything that God makes is that way. It's beautiful from a distance. It's beautiful the more 
closely you examine it. Anything that man makes, just the reverse is true. You look at a beautiful painting, it's, oh, that's beautiful. You examine it real closely, you see a lot of imperfections and brush marks that are not visible from the distance. Well, most people don't have microscopes to look at snowflakes. They just see them on the mountain. And when you get into the mountains of third world countries, you find that uh, your Hebrew lexicon, your Greek lexicon, and all these technical things are not all that significant and meaningful to those people. So I think John kind of brought it down to a level when he taught so that everybody could understand. Clergy and other special groups have a tendency to develop a special nomenclature that keeps people from understanding what you're talking about. You know, uh, for example, pharmacists. To take pills out of a big bottle and put them in a little bottle, how much education does that take, you know? Well, it takes a lot of education because they have a special nomenclature to keep you and me from understanding what they're talking about. And that's why they can charge you so much money for a few little pills. I got some prescription, a prescription of vancomycin from my mother. Two weeks supply was 700 bucks, uh, 756 I think to be exact. But uh, anyhow, there are 5,437 words in the different Greek words in the New Testament scriptures. 5,437. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, there are only 303 different words in all three books. And Brother Seth, who's taught Greek for over 50 years, this is one of the easiest books to translate. So when you're translating Greek texts, why you start here, because this is simple, simple stuff. But at the same time, there are profound ideas. There's a story about the woman from Kansas who went to see the Pacific Ocean for the first time. And they said, what would you think of it? She said, well, I just thought it'd be bigger than that. <laughs> so there's a sense in which we look at a subject and we think, ah, there's nothing to that. But the more we think about it, the more we study about it, the more deep and profound and vast it, it becomes. Now, John gives us some fantastic ideas. Uh, he begins with the idea that that which we've seen and heard, that's what we're declaring to the word of life. That was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at with our, and our hands have touched. That's what we're talking about, you know, the word of life. The word is a vehicle of communication, but he, he's, it's fleshed out. It's, it's not just a, a word on a piece of paper. Jesus came and lived with us. Now, uh, Brother Given knows, I've been talking to him about this, and, I, and I've, got, I've got two books on, on this simple but profound concept. Did Jesus give us a map or is he going to be our guide? He's, he's going to be our guide. He said, I am not abandoning you. I am not leaving you orphans. I'm going to come. I'm going to be with you. It's not just a word on a page. I'm going to be with you. Just not far from here, a few miles from here, Dr. George Washington Carver was born. I hope if you've not visited that historical site, you will do so while you're in the area. He was a man who believed God guided him. He, uh, he synthesized 300 different things from the peanut. And the story down there that they'll tell you that he goes into his laboratory and prays with his Bible. He prays, God, tell me about the universe. Lord, that's too complicated. You can understand that. Tell me about man. No, he's too complicated. You can't understand about him. Well, God, tell me about the peanut. Well, all right. You know, I, I think you can handle it. But now, it, is that not profound? The idea that I don't know where you are, what you're doing, and all this kind of stuff, but if you, it's not just a map. We've seen him with our eye. We've heard him with our ear. Our hands have handled him. It's a real guidance from God. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. And when you trust in him with all your might and lean not unto your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will 
do it. Oh, wow. And these people, however lacking they may have been in formal education. They get that idea, you know, that a guide. Oh, yes. Next concept there in verse 5, and there may be many more, is the idea of light. Everybody knows how difficult it is to do things in the dark and how many tools and how many things you have that are absolutely useless in the dark. But when the day dawns, oh, ho, 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 all of those things that you stumbled over and you couldn't use, they become meaningful. Isn't that saying? These, and that's true of you. That's true of me. That the, the, we're not children of darkness. We're children of light. Very great concept. Then atoning sacrifice is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 2. Again, everybody on earth, it seems like, has some kind of a sacrificial system. And the more you ponder that, the more profound it becomes. A college student from Kansas City spoke to me a couple of weeks ago, and they were just reflecting on death, maybe for the first time in their lives, is seriously thinking about death. All of the ideas, all the dreams, all the, the, the abilities, but when somebody dies, they seem to disappear. And they were pondering, that doesn't seem right. You know, there's somebody with all this study and all this, and, it, and, it, and it's gone. But you see, this is a very key to Christianity because except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. And somehow, as long as you and I hold on to our old life, we are denying ourselves the power of the new life. Amen. Then in uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 20, he talks about anointing. Uh, this is, again, a biblical concept very easily grasped by uneducated people. David was anointed by God. And when he's anointed by God, all of a sudden things changed in his life. New courage, because if he's going to be the king, that means he ain't going to die until he becomes a king. Do you get that idea? That God had a plan for his life. And so whether it was the lions, the bears, the Goliath, whether it was the Philistines, whatever, David seemed to be impervious to any kind of problems and dangers because he's the anointed God. Now, wouldn't it be something if you and I got that kind of boldness? Because we had an anointing. We had an unction. We were different because God... Now, sometimes we die. James, the brother of John, died uh, because Herod beheaded him. But it didn't matter. Whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You know, it was, it, that was God's plan for his life. And so we don't fear death. The sting is gone from death because we're anointed. But if you get now, then this next concept is the idea of birth, being born again. And I, I must resist the temptation to speak at great length on this because I am fascinated by seeds. The more I study, the more I think about it. They're mentioned in Genesis 1.11 for the first time, and every seed reproduced after its own kind, and every seed had this own kind of a genetic code inside of the seed. That was the very basic nature. Well, since every seed reproduces after its own kind, if you want physical life, you plant a physical seed. You want spiritual life, spiritual, that's born of the flesh, is flesh, Nicodemus. This is simple, it's not rocket science. You want apples, you gotta plant an apple seed. You want a fleshly body, you gotta have a fleshly seed. And you and I have a fleshly body because Adam's seed has been passed down from generation to generation to every one of us, and we have the image of Adam. We have his DNA, the DNA. We can determine parentage because we study the genetic code in a strand of hair, a drop of blood. And we can tell somebody's identity because there's a code in that seed. As we have borne the image of the earthly, what's next? We shall also bear the image of, is, now, isn't that something? And you also, also have to remember that the new covenant is like a code. So 
there are six references in 1 John to what happens to you when you are born again. It's like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. You're the same, and yet you're not the same. There's a new kind of life, a new genetic code, not written in tablets of stone, but written in your mind and in your heart. Amen. So the first one is here in chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. As Brother Seth is here, it's ganao as I understand it, and it means to be begotten, and it's hard to determine whether you know, Abraham begat Isaac. Um, was that when Isaac was born, or was that when Sarah was impregnated? Well, I don't know that you can tell the difference all the time, because... Uh, I think that the word may be used in both instances. And, and this is significant, I think, because in the physical world, we are conceived before we're born. And when the life begins inside of the mother's womb, the genetic, your genetic code was already determined at the moment of your conception. Now, you were not born till nine months or so later but your nature, everything about you was determined at that time. And when we think about somebody being begotten of God or born of God, I haven't got it all figured out, but I'm, I'm thinking that God has children in prospect who have not yet been born. That, you know, Paul the apostle was set apart from his mother's womb. There was something special about him and so when we deal with people who are not yet to the level of our spiritual maturity, we need not deny their parentage just because they're not as big or as strong or smart or handsome or whatever as we perceive ourselves to be. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 and in verse 13, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren because we've got the same father. We have the same parents. Sometimes, you know, little children are messy and they make mistakes and they can't talk and can't do all these things, but we're not ashamed of them. We love them too much. They're our family members. And when we see somebody that's immature and making messes and breaking things and so forth, if they got the father's genetic code, they become our brothers or our sisters in Christ, no matter how retarded or immature they may be. But the very nature of God is that they quit sinning. You don't, you know, don't you be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, and extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, you were born again, you received the heavenly sperm the seed, the word. All right, second use is chapter two, verse, I'm sorry, chapter three, verse nine. No one who's born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Third use, chapter four, verse seven. We're getting close to our text now. Dear friends, let's love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Next use is chapter five, verse one. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everybody who loves the Father loves his child as well. I've traveled in several different countries of the world, not as many as perhaps as some of you have traveled but it's been a remarkable revelation to me that wherever I go and find brothers and sisters in Christ, it just seems like I've always known them. There's a certain bond. There's a certain kinship. Bible says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. I always used to just quote that to make people work hard. But the next verse says, she has no ruler in her guide. 
the ant hill, which is so well organized, is somehow structured by a totally different principle than most of us can understand. If they don't have a ruler, don't have a leader, don't have a guide, and yet they all work together. Isn't that something? Jesus said, the elders of the Gentiles have got a system. They lord it over. They have the sergeants and the officers, and they operate on fear. You're gonna, we're going to punish you if you don't do what we tell you to do. It shall not be so among you. Totally different principle. And in this, and we're going to talk about love here because love is the very essence of it. And that's a revolutionary, revolutionary idea with reference to controlling uh, human beings. And, uh, but we'll do that in a moment. Um, the fifth use is verse 4. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The last use is a little repetitious in verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Uh, the one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. It's kind of interesting. There's a trilogy of we knows. Verse 18, we know anyone born of God doesn't continue in sin. Verse 19, we know we're the children of God. The whole world is in control of the evil one. Verse 20, we know we also... Uh, also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Yeah. Now, let's talk about God. King James Version uses the term Godhead three different times. And uh, it's a little different Greek word each time. W.E. Vine, in his uh, study of New Testament words, says that uh, you know the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Godhead is there instead of Trinity. He says the word Godhood would be a better translation, just as priesthood refers to everything pertaining to the function of a priest, Godhood refers to everything pertaining to the function of God. First use, Acts chapter 17, Paul's on Mars Hill. He's lecturing to these people who want to hear and tell some new thing. And he says, you shouldn't think that we're the offspring of God, but you shouldn't think like the Godhead. You shouldn't think that the, the nature of God is anything that a human being can make with his hands or with his mind. We cannot reproduce anything like God either physically or philosophically. We are finite. God isn't. He is infinite. We haven't got any idea how many stars there are. We don't even know how many galaxies there are. But the Bible says the 147th Psalm, God knows every star by name. Amen. <laughs> and he knows how many hairs you have on your head, and he knows about the sparrows. He is infinite. That's the first use of the term Godhead. Second use of the term Godhead is in Romans 1.20. One of my favorite speakers is Henry Morris Sr., scientist and a godly man. He spoke at the Ozark Bible College probably 30 years ago on Romans 120 and oh man I sat on the edge it's you know the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they're without excuse so Dr. Morris said we have a three-dimensional God who manifests himself in three dimensions everything in the universe is space mass or time and uh, he says, there is no such thing as empty space. You say, well, yeah, there's an empty space. No, everywhere there is space, there are light waves, heat waves, sound waves. Something's happening everywhere in the universe. So he says the first dimension is space. That's like God. The second dimension is something that becomes visible in space. That's like Jesus. No man's seen God but the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he's explained him. He has declared him. He makes him understandable. He's the Word, the way that God communicates. But he said, space, mass, and time. You, cannot, you can't hear my voice. You can't read that book. You can't sing that song without time. So the Holy Spirit 
is that which makes the first two dimensions of God become real in your life. Then he went on to say that each of these trinities is itself a trinity. The reality of space is length, breadth, and height. Length is invisible. You can't see length until it has width. And you cannot experience it until it has depth. You can't get married to a picture. No. You have to, you have, to have a three-dimensional person in order to have a marriage. And you can't really experience God or Christ without the Holy Spirit. The reality of time is past, present, and future. Three, three dimensions. But in Colossians chapter 2 is the third use of the term Godhead and it's about Jesus. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in a body and you are complete in Him. The philosophers debate whether or not there is such a thing as an original thought. I'm rather inclined to believe that there is. Every time, you know, uh, some years ago, science claimed to have produced life in a test tube. Under more careful examination, they didn't do that at all. You know, they started with a whole bunch of stuff. Like there's the old joke about the guy that said, well, uh, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to make man out of the dust. So he started messing around with the dust and I said wait a minute get your own dust you know if 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 you're going to do what God did don't start with this you know you start with nothing you know and uh, so uh, I remember Lynn Gardner was telling that uh, J.B. Phillips in the about 1939-40 radar was just being developed and uh, so somebody asked a bunch of teenagers in England if they thought God understood radar. In the book, Your God's Too Small. And he's getting, no, I didn't think so. You know, our scientists can understand it, uh, but it's a little too much for God. Well, fooey. God put radar in bats and fish and so forth thousands of years before man ever dreamed of a system of radar. So, it wasn't an original idea with man. There was already something like that already in existence. We talk about a television set or a camera. Well, you think about the human eye you know, relaying images to the brain. Uh, you talk about a navigational system. We talk the latest state of the art is a global positioning system. Well, God can put into the mind of a little bird that weighs less than a pound. The Arctic plover uh, I'm sorry, the Arctic tern is born in the Arctic and goes to the Antarctic and back every year, never gets lost. 22,000 miles round trip and it weighs less than one pound. I don't know how it does it, but God was in the navigation business a long time before aviation, you know, came up with, aviators came up with a global positioning system or celestial navigation. But now, when we're talking about our text in 1 John chapter 4, this is, uh, this is not speculation, this is not philosophy, this is scripture. We love him because he first loved us. Here is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and became the propitiation for, for our sins. In uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. The word followers is the Greek word mimetes, from which we get our English word mimic. And just as a child mimics its parents, that's the way we learn to talk, that's the way we learn to walk, and all of those things. There is a sense in which we are to imitate God, imitate Jesus. Be you therefore followers of God and walk in love. Now I want to mark my words carefully here because there is a sense in which imitation love or mimic love is bad. 
uh, forgive the reference, but the Bible uses it many times. Uh, Israel was accused of spiritual adultery. They went through the mimicking. They went through the motions. On the outside, they looked like they were making love to God. You draw near to me with your mouth, but not your heart. Your heart is far, is far from me. So when we talk about love, and it's mentioned 46 times here, and it is, as you know, the central theme and doctrine of all the Bible. Now, all truths are equally true, but not all truths are equally important. And I, I just want to, I, I say that repeated a lot, but it is a profound truth. You go out there and you, uh, you find that there's been vandalism on your car and somebody's taken a key and scratched the side of the door of your car and you look underneath there and something has happened and there's oil all over the parking lot where your car is parked and you assume the car has no oil in the crankcase and it has a scratch on the door. Both statements may be equally true, right? But both statements are not equally important. You can drive a long way with a scratch on your door, but probably not very far without oil in the crankcase. So when they came to Jesus and said, which is the great commandment in the Bible? And I must confess to you that many years ago, I would have said there is no such thing as a great commandment in the Bible. Everything God says, every word of the Lord is true. Man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, that's true, but all of the commandments of God are not equally important. So Jesus, without equivocation or hesitation, said the first and great commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's it. The second is similar to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you can't be saved without faith, but you know that love's more important than faith, right? 1 Corinthians 13, it's in your Bible too. <laughs> now abideth faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And again, the, the profound nature of that truth is too much for me. And Paul even said in Ephesians well, Ephesians 1, 17, he wants us to know God better and better, but in Ephesians 3, he says, I want you to come to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You, it's kind of like having a program that's so big, it won't fit on your computer. I, Brother Gibbon has helped me so much with computers, I'm embarrassed sometimes how the juvenile I've been in that area. But I, I remember probably seven, eight years ago, my printer went out and I, I went out and bought a, a different printer and couldn't get the printer to work and I found out in those days my old computer only had four megs of RAM and it took eight megs of RAM to run this printer, you know. And we'd changed wires and we did everything. It was just the computer was too small for the, uh, for the printer. And when we think about the love of God, Ain't enough room. <laughs> it's just, you know, could I with ink the ocean fill, were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. So, we love him because he first loved us. It's not that we love God, but that he, you see, our love is so insignificant in a sense by comparison to the vastness. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all 
that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church through, through uh, Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The apostles, on the night before Jesus died, were fussing and fighting and arguing amongst themselves. They were trying to follow Jesus. The primary command of Jesus to his disciples was follow me 77 times in the four gospels. Follow me, follow me, follow me. They were trying, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Not in any real significant way. That's why Jesus said, wait, wait, don't go out on your own. Wait for power, tarry till you get power. And the night before he is to die, they're arguing about which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus girds himself about with a towel and washes their feet. Do you understand what I'm doing? And I don't think they really did. He said to Peter and the others, you've been following me for three years. Now I'm going where you can't follow me. Peter said, why not? I'm ready to die with you. He said, no. Tonight you'll deny three times you even know me. But I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm not abandoning you. And in John 14, 23, another little bit of trivia, the word Monet is translated mansion, King James Version, only found two times in the Bible, John 14, 2, John 14, 23. In the King James Version, it's translated as abode. Jesus said, I'm going to make an abode or a mansion for you. I want you to make an abode or a mansion for my father and me. My father and I are going to come and we're going to make our abode, our mansion. We're going to dwell. <laughs> we're going to dwell. You're going to be a dwelling place for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Your bodies will be temples of the Holy Spirit. You will not be conformed. You won't learn to love by going to a seminar, by having somebody write a book, or any more than a caterpillar can learn to fly by going to flight school. You know, that's not the way it works. The caterpillar has to go through a profound metamorphosis, a complete change. And so do you, and so do I. We, we, uh, we, we cannot do it on our own. And that's why the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love. What we're talking about now, it doesn't come from just studying and reading and mimicking and aping and so forth. It comes from a seed that's planted with the sperm of God and the DNA of God and the image of God. And all of a sudden, it's no longer I that live. Amen. But it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the miracle of Christianity. And if you don't, and this is why John keeps referring to this over and over again about being born, being born, being born, being born, being born, and how that don't be, you know, try the spirits because there's something real about an apple that's genuine off of a tree. And when you see an imitation apple, it may look like that, it may smell like an apple, but it isn't. And there's no life in it. There's no seeds that will reproduce and replicate itself. And so, when you and I die to self, and when Jesus Christ comes in and dwells in our hearts by faith, all of a sudden, <laughs> if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Amen. Old things are passed away, and everything becomes new. One of my favorite stories, <laughs> I, I, I just, I don't know, this is so illustrative of what Christianity is all about comes out of this magazine called Biography Magazine, March of 1999. It's about a little boy by the name of Mohammed. He was born of all places in Timbuktu, famous city of North Africa. There really is a city by that name in the country of Mali. Came from a large family. He was born crippled, had a club foot, birth defects. Father died when he was small. His mother took the children and went to the neighboring country of Niger, Nigeria, and uh, were trying to escape the famine. The people of Mali are light-skinned. They are a Negroid people, but their complexion is much lighter 
than the blacks in Nigeria. So uh, they immediately stood out. Little Mohammed injured his foot and he got gangrene and maggots in his clubbed foot. Didn't have a daddy. He was roaming the streets there starving. And he took boiling water and poured it on his foot to try and kill the maggots and the gangrene. Didn't work. He took battery acid and poured it in his foot and it stopped the gangrene but it ate away half of his foot. He was hit by a car and he suffered a bunch of broken bones, never went to a doctor, went to a hospital, never went to an emergency room. And then the Nigerian police came and because he had a light complexion and there was famine in their country, they knew he came from Mali, so they put him on a transport and sent him back to Mali. He was separated from his family, and so he decides, I'm going to go back where my family is. And when he was too weak to walk, he would crawl. And people were dying all around him, and he said, fortunately, I had already had most of the diseases they were dying of and had developed an immunity. He was five feet four inches tall, weighed 65 pounds. When he walked, his right ankle bone was flat on the ground. His back looked like an S. He had tuberculosis of the spine, polio, and three kinds of malaria. Diane Sawyer came to Mali doing a report for 60 minutes. And this little boy, Mohammed, got 18 seconds of face time on 60 Minutes. There was a lady in Indianapolis by the name of Cheryl Schatz, S-H-O-T-T-S. She was watching, she was working in the kitchen and uh, she had the television on and when this little boy came on, something happened to her and she said, that's my son. She's white woman, he's black. But he had no family, nobody, he's alone, dying. And she says, I'm going to go get him. She quit her job, maxed out her credit cards, mortgaged the house. And through Diane Sawyer found some missionaries in Mali who knew this kid. And they went through all the paperwork and all the months that it took and they brought him to Indianapolis. Well, he couldn't read, but there was this great big banner. Welcome, Mohammed. You will never be hungry again. It was December the 7th, 1985. The next morning, this little crippled boy makes his way down the stairs and says, where is the grass cutting machine? Where is the rug cleaning machine? Cheryl said, why do you want them? He said, didn't you bring me here to be your houseboy? She said, no. I didn't bring you here to be my houseboy. I brought you here to be my son. He said, I don't know what it means to be a son. You'll have to teach me, but I promise to learn. And I'm praying that when we see the majestic love of God, the Holy Spirit will teach us what it means to be a son and to cry out, Abba. Father.